All right, well, let's get to the Bible Study Manual's website. Here it is. And we're looking at creationism versus evolution <clears throat> from a scientific point of view as we look at creation versus evolution from a scriptural point of view in Genesis chapter 1 and on. It's interesting to look at both kind of at the same time. Both are huge studies. So creationism versus evolution is the second part here. Now, we've looked at most of it. We've moved on down to the classifications of species, indicating that they're artificial. They don't have a scientific or explanation. It's just arbitrary. So the sentence, creation is <coughs> have long suspected. Creationists have long suspected that species classifications were artificial and that a higher ranking such as a genus or a family could be used to best represent the original created kinds. The study on primates and a cursory study on their animals tend to push the definition of kind to this level. We're looking at previously at science's definition of different species does not always reflect reality in an article written by Institute for Creation Research. So, in the case of baboons, for example, the created kind may have been a type of baboon from which these 19 plus species have diversified. These 19 species could be better defined as varieties within a single interbreeding species rather than 19 species and seven genera within a single family. <clears throat> Might be a convenient way of categorizing them to learn it, but it doesn't mean it's scientific that they're all separate species. It could be the same species that has varieties in it, variations. So with the current trend in maintaining as many separate species as possible, it is unlikely that any hybridization tests will be done between drills and mandrills. Unfortunately, this process of forced separation is endangering the animals. Perhaps this issue could, should be readdressed to determine if hybrid vigor and help keep the drills from becoming extinct in the next decade or two. Now, we go on the subject of science. Scientific proof demands observability, repeatability, experimentability, and falsifiability. What does it mean to prove something scientifically? There are some people, and that is leading evolutionists who believe in evolution, who would say that we cannot and have not proved it scientifically, and that those arguments used to prove it scientifically didn't don't really do so. <clears throat> Note that statement by Colin Patterson as he's talking primarily about natural selection. He says, turning now to the second aspect of the theory that natural selection is the cause of evolution, many critics have held that this is not scientific because the expression survival of the fittest makes no predictions except what survives is fit. And so it's dangerous tautologists or an empty repetition of words not scientific. For example, if we were to ask which are the fittest, one might answer be those that survive. So that the survival of the fittest means only the survival of the survivors. 
Sounds like double talk. In this sense, natural selection is not a scientific theory, but a truism. Well, if it survived, it's the fittest. But it may not be the fittest. It may be circumstances here different from over there on the planet. The circumstances weren't provide by, provided by the surviving species, <clears throat> but that's his position. Technically, it cannot be called scientific. Colin Patterson is the author of one of the textbooks used throughout the world entitled Evolution that teaches on that subject. And this textbook is a representative and firm believer in evolution. So how do we know what's scientific and what isn't? There are four basic criteria that are used in order to prove something scientifically. The first is observation, then experimentation, reproduction, and falsification. These four elements are necessary in order to say that an hypothesis is proved scientifically. The question remains, do we observe evolution? Notice the statement by Stebbins, a major evolutionist in our country. He says, the reason that the major steps of evolution have never been observed is that they required millions of years to be completed. How old are you? Stephen Gold, perhaps the best known evolutionist in our country at the time, says major evolutionary change requires too much time for the direct observation, observation of the scale, on the scale of human history. And he says, but that's not only true only in the living world, we find it also true in the fossil world. Notice again from Gould, writing in Natural History, he says, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontologists. We view our data as so bad that we never see the very process we profess to study. Seeing, observing, you see, is what science is. That's what he says. Kitts, another prolific writer in the journals of evolution writing in the Journal of Evolution says, despite the promise that paleontology provides a means of seeing evolution and has presented some nasty difficulties for evolutionists. As we go to the next element of proof, that is an experiment and repeatability. Notice the statement by Dobzhansky, another very famous American evolutionist, writing an American scientist. He says, these evolutionary happenings are unique, unrepeatable, and irreversible. Man evolved one time, he says, from the Austra Australopithecine, and it's unrepeatable. It's not provable either. The applicability of the experimental method to the study of such unique historical processes is severely restricted before all else by the time intervals involved, which far exceed the lifetime of any human experimenter. Unrepeatable, Dobzhansky, outside the realm of experimentation by the nature of the subject itself, unobservable, not repeatable, not subject to experimentation. The only element that's left is falsifiability. But, consider a statement made by Stephen Gould in the publication Discover. Philosopher Karl Popper has agreed for decades that the primary criterion of science is the falsifiability of its theories. We can never prove absolutely, but we can falsify. A set of ideas that cannot in principle be falsified is not science. Now, the idea is the theoretical testing. This may be unfamiliar to most people, but scientists use this as a primary criterion. And if you can set up a test so that if this happens, it's proved. If this happens, it's falsified. Then you have something that can be tested scientifically as falsifiable. And if you can't test it, then it's not really science. And in that connection, notice the statement by Paul Ehrlich, the author of The Population Bomb, been on John and Carson a number of times, writing in Nature says, a theory of evolution has become one which cannot be refuted by any possible observations. So now he's not recommending it here. He's saying it can't be tested. It is thus outside empirical science, but not necessarily false. No one can think of ways in which to test it. And so when we look at the four criteria of science, we find that it, evolution, is not observable, 
and it's not repeatable, it's not subject to experimentation, and it is unfalsifiable. Now, when we say it's unfalsifiable, we say that it is true about much of the argumentation. We do not think it's true about the entire theory. It's true regarding natural selection, survival of the fittest. Those are tautologies that are not falsifiable or testable. In other words, as we will see, as we proceed, it has been falsified. Darwin actually suggested one way in which it could be falsified. He said if you could put, point out there one area where elements would be so complex that they could not naturally develop, then we would have that which would break down, which his theory would not explain. And in Origin of Species on page 183, he says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organism existed which could not possibly have formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So gradually, step by step, it has to break down. And if there is something that we can show that couldn't have developed that way, then he acknowledges that there is a serious problem. But when you look at the four elements again, observation, experimentation, reproduction, falsifiability, as we have seen from these leading scientists, the proof or disproof of evolution is largely outside the technical realm of science. Now, Stephen Gould, Science of the 20th Century. No myth deserves a more emphatic death than the idea that science is an inherently impartial and objective enterprise. Yet it continues to thrive among working scientists because it serves us so well. It also provides the rationale for America's scientific priesthood, the National Academy of Sciences. <clears throat> However, that does not tell us that we cannot study these matters scientifically. We just can't prove it scientifically. What's true of evolution is also true of creation. You can't observe creation, and you can't repeat it. You don't perform experiments with it. And while it, evolution, may be falsifiable in some areas, basically it is not falsifiable overall. So neither can it be proved scientifically. But they can be investigated scientifically, and when we are dealing with science with items that cannot be observed, cannot be repeated, you cannot perform experimentations on them, then we deal with them under the concept of models. Basically, a model is an idea, an hypothesis that we set forth and then compare it with what we see in the living world around us to see if the facts fit the model. But both evolution and creation can be evaluated scientifically. Invariably, when we look at the evidence from anthropology and geology, from physical science, from paleontology, one after the other line up on the side of creation, just looking at the empirical evidence. More plausible on the side of creation. Now we've been looking at Genesis chapter 1, which is part of this study on evolution versus creationism. At the same time, we've covered this. So we'll move on to the next step in creation versus evolution. We'll do that next time.